Hi, I'm Dr. Gerald Dees. Welcome to Health Center from Downstate Medical Center. Today we're going to get into uh, sleep. You know, some people can't go to sleep. Some people can't stay awake. It looks like the normal's in between these kind of things because you like to sleep at night. You like to be awake during the day if you can, especially at work, especially if you're doing things that need eyes. <laughs> There's conditions, and put in the category called narcolepsy in a sense, that, uh, where people can't stay awake and, and so forth. And they try all kinds of things. They give them medications and things like this. They tell them don't drink caffeine and all these kind of stimulants and things like before you go to bed at night. You'd be surprised. A lot of people like to take a toddy at night, for example, alcohol and so forth. Or they like to uh, take a cup of hot chocolate. It feels comforting, but you know. And, or tea. Uh, well, they have teas now where they have no caffeine in it and things like that, so that, the warmth of that would help a great deal. But we want to get into sleep problems because people uh, need sleep. Your heart has to rest. You know, I tell the students all the time, or tell myself all the time, uh, I get very uncomfortable when I go to bed because I think my heart's going to rest also. <laughs> but it doesn't rest. It stays in the chest, you know, and it beats like this. Whether you're awake or asleep, it has to beat, and it has to have nutrients to beat like this. All the way through the rest of your life, it has to beat. It can't stop at all. Well, the brain is functioning all night long also. Functioning. Dreams come in, things you do during the day, past days and things like this that might keep you awake, might wake you up from a terrible dream. Uh, Sometimes I have such a nice dream when I wake up and the bed was warm, uh, I, I, I had wet the bed. <laughs> and so, and I used to be a bed wetter in a sense when I was a child. Uh, and just the warmth of the bed, uh, of the water and things like that woke me up. And you couldn't go back to sleep, which caused a disturbance. So we have here a doctor, uh, at, uh, Fisher here at Downstate Medical Center, uh, chairman of the pediatrics department who has a sleep center. Uh, we can now diagnose uh, folks who might have problems with sleeping and what might be keeping them are uh, awake or sleeping too long and get into difficult, uh, difficulties. And so I want to welcome you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Dees. Yes. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I like your analogy of the, uh, the heart beating and, and the brain and I'm working during the night, but the, the brain definitely gets fatigued and it needs those dreams to relax and in different phases of sleep. Sure. If, you, if you don't get it, then you're the brain is still fatigued when you wake up in the morning. That's right. Well, you right. know what, Dr. What I like to do, so folks can know who you are at Downstate Medical Center, because you might not, you might not know we, who the chairman of the Department of Pediatrics is a very important part of our services here. Just a little of your background and maybe even how you got into this whole field. Well, uh, I'm uh, uh, actually a pediatric gastroenterologist. I'm not a sleep specialist, okay. but we do have we do have in our department uh, sleep specialists, and oh. and our sleep center is is geared not only for children. We have three rooms for children. But we have five rooms for adults. So I we see. take care of adults who have sleep problems as well as children. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my background uh, is that uh, I came here to Downstate about 15 years ago from North Shore uh, Health Center mm -hmm. and uh, out on Long Island. Before that, I was at University of Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, and uh, I went to a medical school bef uh, at Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. uh, and then trained at the University of Pittsburgh. Right, in right. pediatrics and then pediatric gastroenterology. Right, right. So um, here as the, the chairman of uh, pediatrics, uh, I've actually, actually learned about uh, the sleep disorders and what it means uh, and how it can affect children, how it affects adults. It's different, but the basic theme is the same, that if you don't get a good night's rest, right. you can't function the next day. That's right. Sure. And if you are chronically not getting rest, right. uh, it can have adverse effects on your, uh, on your whole system. It yes. may make you have an, an increased appetite and put on weight. Mm -hmm. You might not have the uh, desire to exercise and also put on weight. Yeah, uh, hypertension, high blood pressure mm -hmm. is uh, uh, one of the consequences of, n of, of chronically not getting a good night's rest. Right. Um, so it can affect your heart. It can affect uh, the, um, your lung function, uh, it affects your, your function at, at work the next day, you know, so uh, adults who fall asleep at work, it may not be that there's anything wrong with them, it's just they didn't get 
a good, thorough night's sleep. Surely, surely. And what often happens is people um, are not getting oxygen to their brain mm -hmm. uh, while they're sleeping because something is obstructing their airway. Right, right. Uh, it, we, we, we call it snoring. Right, we call it, and but the technical term, of course, is sleep apnea. That's but right. But it's the same Obstruct, thing. Obstructive yeah. sleep apnea. Right, and you know, our um, folks don't realize that you get a sh cut off of oxygen going to the brain even momentarily, affects those little neurons, right. and they and they dis disarrange the whole thing. Right, and and it triggers uh, chemical reactions in your body, which is why you get the high blood pressure, and you and, yeah, uh, and your heart starts to beat faster, and you're so you're fatiguing your system as well. Yes, uh, there are some people who who do have neurological problems that mm -hmm. cause them to. Uh, not sleep properly, and, and our neurologists who are also involved in our sleep center, I see. Uh, they have patients like that. But the majority of people are your average friend who's at work with you, who snores at night, doesn't uh, get uh, proper oxygenation to the brain and to their system, and they wake up in the middle of the night. Sometimes they actually stop breathing oh, yes. because of that obstruction, uh, and that's where the word apnea comes from, right, without surely. breathing. Right. Um, but it, it can be just obstruction without apnea right. uh, that uh, reduces the oxygenation, and it can have uh, adverse effects on your, your whole health as well as your performance. Well, you know, I look at all the traffic accidents we have and things like that. And I sometimes wonder how many might be related just to that kind of congestion. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have any statistics on that, but I'm sure there are many people who are driving, who commute, especially here in New York, right. who uh, get tired. I mean, I know if I'm sleep deprived and I'm driving home, because uh, I live on Long Island and I'm driving and I'm stuck in really slow traffic, I start to doze, I have to call my wife up and, and take on, up a conversation just mm. to sort of keep my my brain focused. Well, and you I know, really sometimes I get fatigued like that also. And uh, when I get to the light, and it's a red light, mm -hmm. I, I say I have a certain amount of time. I'm going to close my eyes yeah. and rest it. Micro sleep. But what I do, I put my car in neutral. Uh -huh. Because I have found, in any case, that if you're startled all of a sudden and you wake up like that, which only might be a few moments, you might set the accelerator, mm -hmm. and there you go. Absolutely, <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? And the accidents, all these intersections and things I'm like sure that. I'm sure some of those sort of those things do sometimes happen. I know I, just like you, and, and probably anybody that sees this uh, video will know that this does happen to them sometimes. Yes. Or they'll fall asleep there. They'll they'll even put it in park, and then they'll fall asleep until somebody's honking at them. At you know, the, the light turned green, and and then what do you do? <laughs> you, you you get angry with the person. Uh, one time, uh, somebody blew their horn at me. I said, "What's the matter, bro? You got my my horn and so forth." They said, "You weren't moving. The light was green." <laughs> you right. know, and I was that fast. Uh, right. And of course, uh, they should be getting out of their car and asking if something's wrong. <laughs> but instead, <laughs> That's they're right. they're they just want you to get out of the way. <laughs> That's, That's right. All. Right. <laughs> But getting back into um, uh, the sleep center and things yes. like this, you know, years ago we didn't have sleep centers. We didn't have anything that of that sophistication. And I'm surely the misdiagnosis has been all over the place in the world and things like that. And when you think about it, uh, children might have it, uh, elderly people who you say uh, they're just getting old. Mm -hmm. It's not getting old. It's something happening to their whole physical, mechanical action of their body. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, these things are all linked. If, if you let yourself get uh, to be overweight, that uh, affects the size of the airway. Surely. All right. So, and since it's, uh, the area across the airway is uh, related to the square Mm -hmm. of the radius, yes. that means that, that uh, a small change has a big effect on how much on the cross-sectional area. Surely. And so it's very easy to go from somebody who sleeps well at night and puts on some weight to suddenly they're not, they're now obstructive. Right, uh, right. That airway now cannot sustain enough oxygen. Right. Um, and uh, even if they don't snore, there's some people who don't snore but still have obstructive uh, You know, I, I wrote an article not too long ago about misdiagnosis of asthma. Mm, yes. Asthma. Uh, asthma is a condition of the lung, but asthma can also have the same signs and symptoms of blockage here like you're saying right now, you know. And so, uh, so they'll treat them for asthma with all the asthma drugs, but they miss the whole thing of the obstruction right. here. And then, which that obstruction is 
affecting this. And then there's also the, the, the issue of uh, sometimes that obstruction causes people to reflux. Oh, yes. And they, can, they may get some of that material in their lungs, and that may trigger the asthma. Surely. Uh, Surely. And then there are some people who reflux, and that causes swelling and results in the obstruction. So that they can, it can be one, the chicken or the egg, right. you know, is the issue. But, the, but we can diagnose all those things at the sleep center. Well, you know, the thing was that when I was at Kings County where I trained, I used to, uh, during my residency, I would divide up six months of the residency each year into subspecialties, you know. And uh, I learned in ENT how to use a head mirror. Mm. Now, doctors generally, internists particularly, don't know how to use a head mirror. I don't think anybody uses them anymore. <laughs> oh, but... I, I mean, but, I've used them, but, you know, we're, but, no, we're getting but, old. What I'm trying to say, though, <laughs> yes, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that yeah. it taught me to, I could use two hands to look in the back, right. you know, and, and focus light, you right. see, and, and, and see even our irritation back there and things like this. Because when you say awe, that, that's a second. You can't diagnose nothing with just awe. <laughs> awe what else is there, you know, right. and, it's, and so I'm just saying that even our training in, in medical schools really don't get into these kind of things to give a different, good differential diagnosis. You know? Well, yes, I, 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 I would agree with you. Uh, if, I, if I might, though, you know, elaborate a little bit about our sleep center, right. what we're talking about, and, and whether you look in somebody's throat, as you were just uh, alluding to, and you see big tonsils, for example, sure. or where you can't see, you need a mirror to see a, a small mirror back in the throat to see that the adenoids are enlarged. That's right. in the back of the, the nasal passage. Sure. That's where most of the obstruction occurs in children. Right. But it's not usually the cause of obstruction in adults. Mm -hmm. Adults, is oftentimes, it's because they're overweight is one thing, right. or the way they're sleeping and how they sleep. There are little measures that people can take to, to cut down on snoring. But if they've got high blood pressure or uh, asthma, as you said, uh, they, they can't seem to control their weight, they're right. falling asleep at work, they're not able to get up in the morning, their spouse says, uh, you know, you, you keep getting up in the middle of the night. You know, right, sure. you're, you're, you're snoring really badly. I can't sleep. That's right, you sure. Know, um, That's the big thing. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, we, what we need to do is you need to see your physician. If your physician thinks this is in any way related to obstructive sleep apnea, mm -hmm. uh, then we can diagnose that uh, in the center because your physician will send you uh, you to us mm. and uh, we're able to watch you during a complete sleep cycle, cycle yes. and we can with the little electrodes that are placed and all that see whether you're going into the right dream state like you should be and coming out of sleep properly. Mm -hmm. um, we can see how long it takes you to go into sleep what is known as latency period right. because a short latency means you're probably sleep deprived you're not getting sleep. Right, sure, you know, sure. you, you know years ago I remember in my neighborhood, uh, getting your tonsils and adenoids removed was almost like saying uh, uh, <laughs> this was a normal thing to do. Right. So everybody, I remember sitting at St. John's Hospital uh, with, on a gurney with 10 other kids waiting to go into the <laughs> operating room to have my tonsils and adenoids removed. It's overwhelming when you think about what we did at that particular time right. to remove obstruction because <laughs> we didn't have penicillin mm. like that or anything to uh, take down a, a pussy throat and things right. like this. Well, we didn't, we didn't understand things as well as I think we understand them now. And, and we do sometimes uh, remove the adenoids or the tonsils if the person's uh, sleep Obstruct. obstruction is great. But if a, if a child or an adult can tolerate some of the uh, instruments we have where you can sleep with pressure being put back in, right, we'd sure. rather not have to operate on you. Right. You know, so if they can, but although the machines uh, can be themselves a little noisy, people get used to them mm -hmm. and they get, uh, the, the other thing that's important about this is that our treatment, which is based upon doing these studies, mm -hmm. um, the treatment can uh, uh, definitely benefit uh, both children and adults if sleep apnea is the problem right, because right. we can improve their memory. Oh, we can surely. improve school performance. Uh, we can improve uh, their job performance. Right. So, and and uh, if they're getting enough sleep, and they're, we can. It's probably going to be more effective for us to, to be help them to lose weight if that's part of the problem. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, look at the whole field of medicine. Sometime, uh, uh, little. We don't know that much. When you think about how much we know right at this point, there's going to be so many more things that we're going to develop 
you know, and we have to keep these developments going uh, to the average person. Of course, like you say, uh, with new health issues coming in now, insurances and things like this, to say, I want to refer this person to an ENT person or this person or a pulmonary person, it might be harder and harder because these folks are going to be now overworked because people like yourself bringing it to the community are going to demand this kind of testing. Well, if your physician is confident, uh, your general practitioner is confident that there may be an element of sleep apnea, they can, you can refer directly to the sleep center, for example. You don't have to go through a specialist. With the children, though, we've, because if they have secondary problems, if they have high blood pressure, uh, or if they do have asthma, we like mm -hmm. to have the right specialist see them first and then get them in because our specialist ultimately is going to be the one who's going to fit them with the the positive pressure right. uh, machine or is going to recommend that they have their tonsils out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think that working hand in hand with the primary care physician is what we're about. Okay. Uh, we don't require that, uh, that one of our specialists uh, sees the patient first, mm -hmm. but uh, if the patient has a positive test, mm -hmm. then we like we recommend that uh, one of our specialists see the patient, bec depending on what the uh, the problem is, so that we can work with the primary doctor so and and uh, and, and get the right treatment. Is it, are these folks significant in numbers that we could demand even? insurance companies would pay for the referral or this kind of thing? Uh, the insurance companies will pay for this. Okay. Uh, and uh, in, in children, they the insurance companies, uh, I believe, will only pay for a sleep center study uh, mm -hmm. because the uh, National Association, uh, the Ear, Nose, and Throat, uh, otolaryngology, of course, is the term, they uh, recommend that children should not have home studies. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a, you know, our sleep center, which we feel is uh, more complete. When you get it at a sleep center like ours, it's really easy and convenient because you drive up. We have a parking lot right there. Oh, yes, uh, And you come in and you just go to sleep. <laughs> and you wake up in the morning and you can shower and go to work. Is there a number that you could give that folks could? Or, uh, you're uh, you're going to catch me on this one. I right. didn't bring well, the number well, with what me. What we'll do, we'll put it yeah. in the two. We'll put it in the uh, film, in the in the video, right? Yeah, you know, I uh, um, remember so often uh, uh, when I was a child, uh, so many of these tests and things that poor people just didn't get, you know, and uh, and it's really sad that you had to have a certain income to get these kind of things, and yet uh, our prisons, our um, children acting up in school and things like this, it's, it's a real problem today. Uh, or even learning is a real problem, right. you know, and it's something as simple as diagnosing that and, and kind of correcting yeah. that. Well, even if a person has an underlying problem, uh, attention deficit, or they have, uh, you, you know, a, a learning disability, sleep deprivation is going to aggravate it, make oh, it yeah. worse. So we want to give the child or the adult uh, the, the, the best chance.
Now, what do you see the future of the sleep center? Because I know that uh, from this program, you'll probably get a deluge of calls and say, well, I think I might have this problem and things like this. And I know you, a center can't handle all of these things at one time. Well, we, we're, not, we're not yet functioning at our at our uh, daily capacity. I see. If people are willing to do it during the, the week, it's easier. The weekends is when everybody wants to, to get their sleep study done. Oh, I know? see. So mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of limited th by the number of rooms we have. And, right. Uh, and everybody seems to want the weekend, but it's easier during the, the weekday. Mm -hmm. Some people, of course, have problems of, with sleeping during the day. Okay. And we can do daytime studies as well. The, I the, see. The, this facility is uh, very, very quiet. You don't hear anything. Right. So you can actually go to sleep. Some people who work at night and sleep during the day, mm -hmm. that's the cycle that they need to have their study done. Right, right, sure. Uh, and we can accommodate them. Well, you know, a lot of hospitals don't have this uh, accommodation, but a medical school like us, uh, I, would, I would think enough money should be put into this where we won't have eight beds for adults or three beds for children and things like this. We should have 40 beds available. In a sense, when I say for the number of people who might want this, after hearing uh, the talk you're giving right now, might want to have these tests and they don't want to wait months down right. the line. They don't have to wait months. We can, we can do it relatively quickly. I, I think the, the wait uh, shouldn't be more than a week or two well, to get good. an appointment. Well, that's good. That's wonderful. Yeah. So it, 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 we can do that. We have to clear in, with insurance. We don't, you don't want to get a you know, $1,000 bill mm -hmm. and find out that your insurance won't pay for it. Right, sure. Uh, so uh, we and we do accept a number of insurance plans. Mm -hmm. uh, we accept whatever they pay, mm -hmm. um, and we get that all processed before the person actually comes. Right, yeah. right. Well, you know, I went to your prenatal centers and right here at Downstate Medical Center when babies are born as big as just big as my hand, and I just look at that the work that you folks are doing here and keeping those babies alive and things, and just the breathing. I imagine is a problem. Yeah, it is. But you know, we use the same principle in positive airway pressure in these little babies right. that we use in somebody who has obstructive sleep apnea. Right, yes. And so you put, you have a mask on and, and that keeps pressure in your airway so that it doesn't collapse. Well, surely. If it doesn't collapse, then you don't have the apnea. Right, right. That's simple. Do you have any relationship of the ENT department here? Or do you work together in any well, cases? Well, yes. Uh, our pulmonary division uh, works closely with the pediatric ENT. And okay. of course, adult pulmonary works with the adult ENT uh, group. And uh, they, they are coordinated. The EN, our ENT specialists will many times refer patients straight away to the center uh -huh. uh, before they'll, they'll decide in, in a child whether they're going to take the adenoids or the tonsils out. I see. Now, being head of pediatrics here, uh, I know it's an awesome job with the number of things that are happening with children today and everything from mal malnutrition to uh, uh, just poor living conditions, uh, uh, you know, all the things that are environmental that's happening. And I'm sure that our, uh, that uh, your department is reaching out in many other cases, just not in just sleep apnea. So I want to congratulate, you know, for this department here at Downstate Medical Center doing an awesome job to keep our children and babies alive and, and so forth. So as a last statement, is anything you'd okay, like to say? Okay, thank you. Yes, but listen, it's so good having you here, uh, Dr. Fisher, because I've seen you constantly walking down the halls with mm -hmm. students and having a department that's functioning well and around. Hopefully we can keep that department up to its snuff by having adequate monies coming in because money seems to be one of the biggest things. Money today. is an important thing these days, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, and what is health? Health is more just as important. And we're spending so much money on so many other things, you know. So uh, I just want to uh, congratulate you on our wonderful uh, department. And I'm going to be visiting your sleep center myself to, not that I'm sleepy all the time, but I, I like to see where I can refer patients to. So right. thanks again okay. for being Thank with you. us. So you folks out there, yep. you folks out there, remember if you can't stay awake or you're sleeping too much or whatever is happening to you, it's an important thing that you take care of these kind of things. Say, ask your physician to have certain tests. Or if you can't name the test, say, is there any test that I can do to, to prevent me from, you know, falling asleep and things like this. So here we at Downstate Medical Center have all these things available to you. So uh, you'll see a number on the screen that you can call and get a referral for that. So I'll see you the next time if I don't go to sleep. <laughs> Bye.